right, people of the world, and perhaps beyond. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks podcast. My name is Jay Brown. Welcome and thanks to new and returning listeners. Special thanks to everybody who reached out to me this week after last week's intro where I expressed doubts and confusion in myself, which is not unusual. Many of you decided to take a moment to send me an email to encourage me and tell me that you appreciate this part of the podcast where I talk to you before my conversation with the guest. And I just enjoy so much getting those contacts from you. The consensus seems to be that I am sometimes a bit too hard on myself, and that is not anything new. I have a very specific memory. When I was a young boy, I can't remember exactly how old, I was listening to my father talk about me to someone else in the next room, and he was saying, oh, I don't have to be hard on Jay. He's harder on himself than I could ever be. And I think that is true still to this day, but it feels very good to know that you guys are out there and that you might care at all. Today, I am mostly going to forego this opening check-in, though, because the comments that I would like to make really are best made after you listen to this talk with Jill Miller. They are directly in relationship to the conversation that we have. I, I haven't stopped thinking about it since we recorded it. When we scheduled our time together, I did not realize how soon after her surgery it was going to be. Now, very often in these talks, it, it takes some time, I feel like, for us to kind of settle into our conversation and get to stuff where we, we kind of relax into the fact that we're recording. But with Jill, like within 20 minutes, we're like already all the way there. You'll hear. And it's, it's a very intense conversation. I really encourage you to listen to it all the way through. And then I really do have some things that I need to say on the other side. Before we listen to today's talk, let me mention a couple things. First of all, next week, Annika Lucas is coming back on the podcast. I don't know if you remember, she's been on the podcast before. That was one of the really big epiphanous moments for me with the podcast. Her story is really quite amazing, and it was one of the first times that I really was like, dealing with my male privilege, which I've written about a couple of times. Annika has been like doing a Me Too campaign uh, long before the more recent manifestation of that. And we had a, a very engaged and quite intense as well conversation that's going to happen next week. The reason I mention is not just because I want you to know that that's happening next week, but because I kind of screwed up a little bit. I had thought that it was going to time out that my talk with Annika would happen this week, but I got things screwed up and it, it got turned around and it's going to post next week. And this week, tomorrow on Tuesday is this Giving Tuesday where if you give to not-for-profit organizations, then there's matching funds. And Annika is the head of Liberation Prison Yoga. I'm on that board, and I really want to encourage everybody to go tomorrow on Tuesday. I think you might have to do it through like a Facebook donation page. It'll be on my Facebook timeline. It'll be on the Liberation Prison Yoga timeline if you go on there and you are able to be generous and give something to support the work that Liberation Prison Yoga does which I really want to encourage you to do, having been on the inside, what they're doing, bringing yoga into prisons and the kind of impact they're having is incredible. And I really want to encourage everybody to support them. Do give whatever you can tomorrow on Tuesday. Let me also mention my stuff. I am going to be in London at Tri Yoga Camden, January 12th through 14th. I'm going to be in Armonk, New York at Sage and the Flying Buddha, February 3rd. And I'm going to be in Chapel Hill, North Carolina at Triangle Yoga on February 16th through 18th. You can find out about those 
gigs. You can read my blog and listen to the archives of this podcast and find out about my online yoga video offerings, including my live stream subscription. There's only one week left, you guys, until the end of this month to lock in the $7 introductory rate before it goes up to $10. If you lock it in now, you can have that introductory rate on the live stream subscription with 24-hour access. All of that stuff can be found at jbrownyoga.com. Supporting the podcast is a really cool thing to do. You can go to a blogger podcast page and make a direct donation. That is always a wonderful gesture that people sometimes make. Or you could also go to iTunes, write a review, and give us some stars. That's pretty cool too. We'd love it if you did any of those things. But really, we're just grateful that you're listening. And shucks, like I said, I think we should just get to the talk today. Um, I'm sorry if that's disappointing to those of you who are hoping to hear more about what happened in my life. (laughs) Honestly, again, everything I need to say wants to be said after we listen to this talk today with Jill Miller. Jay. Yes. Hi. 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 Is that a better sound? I think that's pretty good. I was just messing around with some levels while you were getting your tea. Okay, fine. Cool. Well, how are you? Um, Well, I'm like both totally shitty and totally awesome. (laughs) As any, I mean, as anyone who goes through major surgery, you know the reality of of all the stuff that you experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's one of the first things I kind of wanted to ask about because. When we scheduled this um, time together, had you already had your surgery or were you yet to have your surgery? Oh, I was yet to have my surgery. So I think you reached out to me. um, Didn't you reach out to... uh, I think you reached out to me after I put up my the blog yes, about right. that I was right, going right, to right. surgery. A couple of days yeah. after it dropped, I think. Yes, yes, definitely. And that's so, when, yeah. So that's only been a couple of weeks. No, no, no. Well, the blog has been a couple of weeks, but the surgery is eight days ago. I know. That's what I mean. The blog right. a couple of weeks. So in the last couple of weeks, you had the surgery eight days ago. That's correct. Wow. And I have to also admit that like after we talked, I heard you on Yoga Land. And I was, well, like, she, I was yep. like, oh my God, oh no, they already had the conversation. But then I realized, no, we oh, didn't. wait, now she had the surgery. That's right. You've got the scoop. You've got the no, scoop. It's not about the scoop. You know, <laughs> let me be really, let me be very upfront with you and sure. anybody who might be listening to this. Like sure. I, I have been very excited and scared to talk to you, frankly. What? Because you and I, I think share some similar story and I've never had any imaging done on my right hip. And I've lived with, I've not lived, I mean, I've managed chronic pain and what I believe is my sacroiliac joint, but it could be a lot of things, frankly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's been, you know, totally functional. I do everything I want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, But listening to your story and reading your blog And hearing you kind of then getting the imaging done, like I have a pretty strong feeling that if I were to get some imaging done, it would reveal like a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to talk to you today. Yeah. I also really just appreciate, I feel like it's been a, like a dirty secret for a long time. Like when senior teachers have to get hip replacements and it's happened Mm-hmm. and they don't tell anybody or it's like it mm-hmm. never gets talked about. Mm-hmm. And I know you got like all kinds of flack online, which I was surprised about, but so fun, but it, <laughs> but I guess it's also because you're someone like me who also recognized like some while ago that maybe things that you were doing in practice were not so great and hurting you. And we mm-hmm. made changes and we like made our whole thing yes. as teachers Yes. Having this kind of orientation that's around like a therapeutic orientation, like more healthy, and then yet still having to come up against it. Mm -hmm. And then to choose to be public about it, I just felt like I really appreciated it. Even if other people found it problematic, I just want to commend you and say thanks. 
Thank you, Jay. You're very welcome. And then now, I guess, first of all, let's go back to how you're doing. You had surgery eight days ago. Are we recording right now? Or yeah, yeah, we're totally. We, oh my gosh! Oh, okay. Yeah, yes. I hope that's okay. <laughs> I, I just sort of it's, like to get into a conversation, and I was recording, so I mean, I don't yeah, think well, we said wipe, anything we'd wipe, have to be embarrassed about or anything. Not at all. Let me just wipe the tears off my face. Okay, and, uh, sorry. Maybe, <laughs> and I'll say less ums and uh huhs, and no, I'll, I'll. That's okay. No, the ums <laughs> and the ahs. That's all us just talking. Oh, cool. I'm sorry. I'm so fresh. God, eight days. So. Talk to me. How I saw pictures of you standing, and everybody's like, "What are you doing standing?" And well, I'm following my doctor's protocol. Yeah, the, yeah. You know, my there's so much you said. What you just said, you should probably just transcribe and put that out as a blog. <laughs> um. All right. So eight days post surgery. Gosh, everything I've done, you know, in the last eight days has been doctor's orders. And in fact, I'm falling short of doctor's orders. So that's even something I would love to share with your listeners is that I'm actually supposed to walk five times a day and let pain be the barometer of how far to quote unquote go or push myself. And I, I haven't been walking five times a day. I walk around my house, but I haven't gone outside rhythmically for those five times a day. I certainly uh, make sure that I'm active every hour or every hour, hour and a half. But um, I think some of, we, and, and and when I talked to my PT yesterday, she was like, oh yeah, well, we overshoot because we know people, we know people are not going to actually do everything we say. So we actually prescribe more than what we think people will do. So that, so in terms of people freaking out about activity, I think the reason people are freaking out about activity, or the very few, excuse me, there's very few people that are um, like, what's going on? Like, why are you moving? Or why are you walking on crutches moments after you came out of surgery? It's because this is about preventing blood clots, and this is about making sure that you don't lose your motor maps of those tissues. Even though they're cut and injured, you need to keep resurrecting and refreshing that um, that connection. It's very important to re-inhabit and to inhabit, um, inhabit it all. And that means also inhabiting the pain. Of course, they give you a lot of medication to dim that switch. And I'm I'm only taking right now the aspirin that I'm supposed to take for blood thinning. I'm not taking Advil, I'm not taking Norco, I'm not taking, um, yeah, I stopped taking, I took my last Advil last night because it does, so I don't really feel like it's doing anything anyway. Movement is the thing that reduces my pain. And <laughs> interestingly enough, it, that's what got me here in the first place. And that's, well, that's what's so intimidating. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's interesting what you said. Sorry to jump in, but I Go something I've said, and you just kind of confirmed it, it does seem like there used to be an idea in the past that when you had like a surgery or an injury, a lot of times or trauma, like you just had bed rest. You just right. like laid in bed. But now the idea is you remain active within mm-hmm. the limits of your pain. Exactly. And determining the limits of your pain is a whole other question. Which, that's a whole other 9,000 <laughs> podcasts. Yeah. But, I mean, that's, that sort of goes to maybe why we're in the situation we're in <laughs> as well. Right. Uh, so yeah. the, it's like, here's where it's, here's where it's to me is that the, the movement dosed correctly, whatever that dose is, and I hate to even like say, oh, you're you know dosing movement, so that it's not like doping movement, right? We're not like I don't want to use the movement to overdose or to you know dope out. Or I like used aggravator, it, aggravator, right? Really aggravate stuff. But I doped out on movement in my teens and twenties when I was, or in very early thirties when I was the yogini mm-hmm. and the dancer, mm-hmm. and. I, I went into cocoon-like stages and states of being in order to be able to put my legs behind my head, in order to be able to do those jump backs from Lotus, in order mm-hmm. to do the straddle splits, all the things that I call dessert poses, all my dessert poses, I, 
I, I binged on them just like I used to binge on ice cream and chocolate eclairs and pizza or whatever I did when I was bulimic and then, you know, retched and threw it up and, um, you know, rid myself of, of the toxin. So I coming from, you know, and really and the reason I'm threading those things together is that my need to overdose on movement was coming from the same place inside of me that my unquenchable um, need to eat was when I was, you know, actively in my eating disorder. And so the, the compulsive movement needs were, were really, you know, ultimately um, hiding my hiding my trauma or hiding my feelings or covering them, covering them with a wonderful stretchy blanket that was my coping mechanism. Food was my coping mechanism. Movement and stretch were my coping mechanism. And that set the stage for the arthritis for sure. But the last 12 years, I feel like my hip just led me to be really a conservationist Mm -hmm. and a movement, you know, movement intellect um, and a much more homeopathic doser. Mm-hmm. And, and most and, more like kind of corrective or like trying to, you, you have a thing called yoga tune up, which is about like yeah. making sure your yoga doesn't kill you or whatever, <laughs> or hurt you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Make sure that the, that it, that the breakdown stops, yeah. right? Because the tune up, a tune up when you're looking at a car is, is, you know, pre- is preventing a breakdown. Yeah. And well, I was breaking myself down. I was breaking myself apart from limb to limb. And when I started to turn towards, you know, deep dives into studies of anatomy and physiology and recognizing, and this is my, my opinion, that the, the yogic states of exuberance of the, the yogic highs, the mudras, the japa, the drishti, you know, all these, the, all these tools of autonomic tinkering could actually be explained through, um, through this, through, through science. And I didn't have to get lost in the art or the mysticism anymore. I could actually make it a lot more a grounded experience. Mm-hmm. And and understand the experience instead of ascribing it to a god or goddess. And and but I could go back and forth now. I mean, I could, you know, it's like sometimes we we there are times in our life when we need that and we need to, gosh, embrace the mystery. And it's still mysterious. Well, you know, it's interesting to me because I I had a similar experience in that I wasn't coming to the same reasons. I had my own other traumas through grief and death that happened in my life. But the idea that there's schools of yoga and philosophies of yoga that are, they're based in transcendental consciousness. Mm -hmm. And then that often can get mixed with like really intense uh, body stuff. So there's like the actual high, like you use this expression doping out on poses, you know, (laughs) and there's, there's actually like physical, you know, when you work your body like that, I've put my legs behind my head too, and done 108 jump backs in my life and live to regret that some, but at the time you can work yourself into states and this idea of transcendental consciousness. And I, I too took that to a place that I knew I had to change what I was doing and did. And it seems like when you hit that point, you, you looked to like anatomy and physiology and sort of science some. Well, yeah, because the yogic texts were like saying stuff like, let the, let the swan fly up. And your hair, and and an old man's hair turns black again. That's you know, right. it was oh, so I've read like that stuff. Like you won't get gray hair. Yes, I've heard that. <laughs> like, like stop it. No, yeah, stop it. Yeah, yeah. So I just I had to figure out why I was having these experiences, and I wasn't okay with it just being a sloka. And that was that was a big turning point for me. Um, by the way, doping on as much meditation as practice or as asana practice because a lot of the people who have criticized my story um one of their favorite things to throw out at me was you weren't really doing yoga then oh right and i just love it when people say that (laughs) it's just so it's just the ultimate um 
glass house stone throw moment. And I said this on the, the yoga line podcast and I'll say it again because I just think Andrea Jane's definition of yoga is my favorite ever. And I just want to repeat it here, which is back in um, April, I did a, a talk in Toronto with a panel of amazing people curated by Matthew Remsky um, and uh, Andrew Tanner from Yoga Alliance and Diane Bondi, um, Carol Horton, Michael Stone, may he rest in peace, and uh, myself and Andrea Jane did these talks. And Andrea was about appropriation of cultural appropriation of yoga in the West and, and in India. And she just said, here's the definition of yoga according to what I've figured out. Yoga is whatever you say it is. <laughs> so when people say you weren't doing yoga, it's like, whoa, I wasn't doing your definition of yoga. Okay, that's all right. I was doing my definition of yoga, and I was having a great time. I was having a blast. Well, I know what you mean by doping out on meditation, too. I did that, too. I <laughs> sat for long hours and had deep internal blissful experiences. And then when I was done and had to, like, go out into my life, everything was a wreck, you know? like. <gasps> and so oh it's, at a certain point, you know, it was like if what I was doing, in, if, I, if I'm sitting and I have this blissful inward experience, but then everything else in my life, like relationships and everything is messed up, in a way, the meditating made my life worse. Like, cause right. it wasn't going into my life at all. You know, it was like removing me. I, I remember at one of my, one of my peaks of practice yet low points of life, uh, I started, I got put on notice in my job. I was a waitress at the time and they were like, you're just moving too slow. You used to, I mean, at one point they had given me an award for being the best waitress in that restaurant. And then when I was at like sort of my peak of yogic dissociation and meditation doping. Um, I, yeah, they were like, you're too slow. You're not moving fast enough with customers. It was because I was just a zombie from uh, overdosing on on that. And so it's inter- it is interesting. And yes, and so that was taking me away from the world. And it shouldn't, it, I, I don't believe it should be that. I think this is this is just one more tool that can and should help with us being an integrated human being in in, in, in all ways. But I, I had to find that out for myself in my late 20s, early 30s through a series of relationship destructions. And, you know, like there were, mm-hmm. it sounds like we do have a lot in common, yeah, Jay. Yeah, yes. <laughs> you know, even more, you know, I was like doing a little checking before we talked and someone was like referring to, they were remembering being in a forest yoga circle with you in 1995. And they said you were 22 years old. I don't know if that's accurate. Mm. But I heard that and I was like, oh crap, I was in 1995, I was 22 years old. I was at the Jiva Mukti Yoga Center on Second Avenue. But like, I just feel like, oh, we, we've paralleled some, even in terms of like making a change at some point. And I'm wondering, like you mentioned that from early on you had a, you know, an eating disorder. And you, I remember hearing you talk about another podcast about even your father making like a mentioning to you, like really early on that you were being obsessive about stretching at like a really, really yeah. young age. Yeah. There were, it was actually, so I think I was 25 in 1995. I'd have okay. to like get a calculator out. Okay. <laughs> yes. uh, that's fine. But I yes. didn't need to like test your math, but <laughs> that's so mean. I, I'm right around Dude, there. I we're still, within like, I'm a few eight. years of each other, one way or the other. Exactly. No. And I, we definitely were leading parallel lives. Um, okay. So yeah, when I was, either 14, 15, or 16, I can't remember the exact age, I was, you know, I had my little yoga routine, and I would do it every single day, and my parents were divorced, so I'd spend the summers with my dad, and he had this a beautiful carpet in his living room that was this giant red circle, it was like a mandala, unbelievable, this carpet, thick, <sighs> such a great gauge for yoga practice. It was before I even had a yoga mat because back then you, I didn't get my first yoga mat until I think I was 18. Mm-hmm. So we didn't back then in the dark ages, we didn't yeah. have yoga. Mats. And they were uh, all light blue at the very beginning. No, my, mine was green. It was Ooh. basically a carpet. It was something that you would put underneath a carpet. So oh, it was from oh, carpet stores. Was like a you got it. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. the first ones they put out, they were all light blue. <laughs> sure. Yes. And I had, I'm sure I had that one too. Um, and actually, and then once I got my Manduka back, I, my, I never looked back because that mm-hmm. thing is friggin' durable. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So, but, but yeah, so I was doing my thing in the living room 
And my dad, who's a doctor, uh, came and sat down in the living room for many, many, many minutes while I was practicing. And I was under scrutiny. I mean, I could feel his unblinking gaze and he was leaning forward and staring at me in the weirdest way. And I, as a teen girl, I mean, I'm just super self-conscious. What's my dad looking at? And I don't know, at some point I looked up, maybe it was like, you know, what, that kind of a thing. And he said, we really need to talk about this obsessive compulsive need. You have to stretch. Mm. And I felt sick. I felt, I felt labeled. I felt sickened. I felt dirty. I felt um, wrong. And I felt defiant and angry. Um, I didn't really fully know what it meant, but I knew what it was. It was bad. And I had heard that actually a few years prior. It was when I was 12 is when I started getting into movement practices, 11 or 12. My mom had brought home, this is in Santa Fe, New Mexico, about a thousand, you know, a thousand miles away from San Diego where my dad was. Um, when I first started moving, it was because my mom had brought home videos. She brought home the Jane Fonda workout hmm. and the Raquel Walsh yoga video. And we, we lived in a solar home off the grid. And so hmm. videos was one of our main ways of getting entertainment. And I was the chubby kid. And so um, I was not into moving. My, my sister was really athletic. And I just was into reading and my dogs and my dolls. She brought those those tools home, those videos home, and I, they turned me on. I mean, I got obsessed. I got into doing them every single day after school, sixth grade, seventh grade, and then I actually started taking classes. I don't know how. Uh, maybe out with my stepmom. I think I probably started taking some classes with my stepmom and started learning, getting back into dance. But I, I remember, distinctly remember, doing my homework in the, that kitchen in Santa Fe because we had a, a tile floor in this solar home. And it's a Mexican tile floor. And if you've never seen Mexican tile, they're these square clay bricks. Mm -hmm. And they're all, I don't know, maybe nine by nine by nine by nine. And there's a little bit of an arc to them. And then there's a grout, very thick grout. Uh And so I would position myself on top of one of these squares, the very very center of a square. And I would uh, pirouette which if you know the world of dance, a pirouette is a a spin that is a a perfect spin. It makes your body like a top. And if you're any degree off, you'll topple. And so I would... I've never told the story, Jay. I would um, do these pirouettes for like dozens of minutes until I did the perfect pirouette. And then I would start my homework. Um... And I just remember one time my mom just walking through the kitchen and just over, just off the cuff saying, you've got obsessive compulsive disorder. Like she just threw those, that word out. You've got obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, while I was doing my pirouettes, you know, before doing homework. And so when my dad said this like two years later or whatever, he said it after she had said it, I knew I, there was something wrong with me. And, um, but neither one of them said, Jill, what's wrong What's wrong? So, um, well, um, <laughs> I need them to um, say that. I need them to stare at me. I, do you do you know now what was wrong? Um, I do. I mean, it's stuff I. I, I know some of it. I mean, stuff I've I'm in trauma therapy for the last few years mm-hmm. to root down and um, yeah, flesh out through my flesh what these what the um, what the story is and what the pain was and what the family dynamic. Um, the nuclear nuclear family dynamic, that family of origin, what were the um, pains and threats that I was running from? And some of them I'm not comfortable still, I'm not comfortable talking about out loud, but I was um, um, 
Yeah. I mean, it, the, no, you, know, you don't have to. I just, to me, like what you're, it's so funny when people talk about like, you're not doing real yoga. Like that's real yoga right there. <laughs> As for me, like to me, it, what, I don't know that, that definition of yoga that you gave about like, it's anything you want to say what it is. Well, you know, for me, I've always felt that it's about getting to the bottom of you in a sense. And often that's about having to navigate deep traumas or wounds or it's different for different people. I have mine, which is very different from yours, but my yoga is absolutely about that because that's like the key to my health. Right. Like it's, it is a physical thing and I've used my body to try to suss it out. Like you have, you know, it's like, yeah, it's a weird thing. It's hard to like articulate how doing breathing and moving exercises <laughs> like helps you address the core of who you are as a being. Like it's, it's not like very clear how that connection gets made. Um, and I know like in your work, you focus a lot on the anatomy and the science that's at work. And I think that's super valuable, but what we're talking yeah. about now to me personally is like the real yoga, you know, like that you are just so vulnerable to share that honest glimpse of your real situation is very powerful, you know, and to me, the real work of practice yeah, and that's that's what all my teachers always indicated to me, and it's why I stayed in the pursuit of this practice and um, continuing to, you know, crawl through different formats of yoga, different art forms of it, to glean the wisdom that these different body positions and these meditation strategies and these breathing strategies and these, um, you know, group dynamic strategies could offer me. And then, you know, teaching it, of course, has taught me way more than even my initial practice because then you get to see the laboratory and the reflections, you know, amongst a group. It's just been an incredible um, tool, but I, I do realize that the the, there, there's more <laughs> that yoga, the way I initially was, uh, I'd say using it or abusing it or engaged with it. Um, I was so committed to it and did indeed think it was a panacea. I've been watching with like deep interest, Leah Rem- Remini's program on Scientology, The Aftermath. I don't know if you've seen that. Mm-hmm. A little, I haven't seen a lot of it, but a bit. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and I'm I'm personally obsessed with cult dynamics and mm-hmm. <laughs> because I, I really do feel like I drank the Kool-Aid in such, you know, not like gallon form, but I mean, gas tanker truck form like i just was like you just um and and that i've been i've had to deprogram myself and i think there there's still parts of it i haven't deprogrammed from yet i know i haven't and that also is like knowing that oh here's a box i haven't fully explored of of the why of why i committed in the way i did is is also really exciting to me but it this is a, a pr- the process of unwinding from that commitment is is uh, is i think as many years as the years of engaging you know hardly in it if you watch the 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 God, what's it called? The beginning of a TV show, the credits, the opening credits, and Leah Leah Remini, Remini is like, oh, there is no there is no world without Scientology. You can't have a good world without it. Uh, I can hear myself saying the exact same thing about yoga when I was, gosh, I was its like biggest adherent, and 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 don't get me wrong, it's freaking awesome. Yeah. But you know what else is awesome? You know what else is awesome? Like being in a relationship with a person yeah. and not just with your yoga practice. And yeah. Like, yeah. You know what's awesome? Being a mom. You know what else is awesome? Lifting heavy weights. You know what else is, is awesome? Like just being a goof, which yeah. is not a problem for me because I've always been a dancer. Yeah. Um, you know what else is awesome? Rolling around on balls. So um, I'm just glad that I've diversified my my stuff and yeah. um, and and taken my the learner person in me and the lifelong student personality type that I am and, and being like, yeah, let's go, 
let's go dissect bodies now. And yeah, let's go learn about um, uh, whatever neurochemistry or, you know, just everything that I can possibly do. Mm -hmm. Well, I also, I appreciate that. I think I agree. There's like our own individual like tracks in it, but then there's also this broader wave that I think we rode. Like when we first came into it, there wasn't as much questioning and there was a no. lot of like more Kool-Aid to be drank. I know there <laughs> you know, certainly like, was as the, you know, Theo Wildcraft says we're in this like post lineage place more now. And I think me too, you know, when we first got to yoga, there was always chanting, always chanting. Yes. Nobody yes. asked if they could touch you before they touched you. And it was just, <laughs> that was the way it was. Oh my God. That's, you know? I know that's so funny. Of course so not. No, it wasn't like we really chose to do that over some other type of yoga. That was just what was there. Right. And as like a lot of people have discovered, like as time goes on, stuff gets revealed about those figures and some of them have passed and then the conversations have changed so much. And I just think we, we rode along with that a lot. Yeah. You know, like we and came I, into our adulthood along with yoga going into the mainstream. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And isn't that unique? And when you even say senior teacher to me, I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not a senior teacher. I'll tell you who the senior teachers are. Right. But wait a minute. I guess I am senior now. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Like that statement, because when I was a yoga kid, I knew who the senior teachers were, but I guess there's a lot of yoga kids now. And they think that we're senior just because I'm, maybe I, you know, I'm talking or I have a platform. I've put videos out. Like, mm -hmm. really? I still feel like I'm a sophomore. <laughs> like, I did I my you. first year, you know, <laughs> I got, I got bullied. I, you know, failed. I made my mistakes. Um, and now I'm having to like relearn how to be in this world. Mm -hmm. which well, is but it's yeah. interesting to me. Cause like, I came up with like a slogan, gentle is the new advance and stuff like that to like be like, I'm changing what I'm doing. But you like you even sort of departed more from yoga. Maybe it's not you, but I've heard what you've done in your work described like as like self-care fitness formats. Yep. And I've heard it referred to as corrective exercise format. Mm -hmm. And then it says yoga tuna. But it was almost like when I've seen that, I was like, like it seemed like a conscious effort to make a big distinction. And was that by choice? Was that by design? Yes. So when I, gosh, it's interesting to have these talks, these yoga related talks now, because I don't, I haven't had them mm. in yeah, like part of my like crying a person first, like tune up fitness came before yoga tune up. Is that right? Um, okay. So I'll, I'll, here's our company structure. Okay. Like our company is called tune up fitness worldwide. That came about, it's, it's a stressful story of my, of connecting with my husband. So I had come up with the term yoga tune up, um, gosh, maybe 12 or 13 years ago when I was, I was doing a little video for, um, my mom cause she was going to have, She's like, she's going to have shoulder surgery. So I was like, well, mom, here's a yoga tune up for your shoulders. Hmm. And so I made this like 12 minute video. And I think I just said the word yoga tune up off, just blah, 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 came off my tongue. And then I was like, that's a great name for what I do. Because what I had started to do was teach these little mini moments of disassembling movement. So I was teaching yoga. Um, and I was teaching actually at the forest yoga circle at the time. And I was, I, you know, I was supposed to teach that brand or that art form. I like to I spend I, some time with Anna and my best friend on the planet, his wife and him like traveled around with her a lot. I'm, I'm pretty familiar. It's pretty intense work. I mean, it's powerful a lot of ways, but she's, she's an intense lady. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Indeed. As, as many senior teachers are. Yeah. And so um, but what I was seeing was that the the format that I was called to teach wasn't necessarily addressing, I didn't feel or see that it was addressing some of the chronic complaints that my students had again and again. And I had this whole other arsenal from years of dance and movement, massage, and um, many dance teachers that I could name. But the primary teacher of mine, his name is Glenn Black, who is also known as a, a yoga rogue mm -hmm. and um, has created a lot of controversy because he was featured in William Broad's book as saying yoga is not for everyone. And Well, let me jump in for one second because I, I, 
I kind of met him once or twice. I used to do like week long stints as the core faculty teacher at Omega. Oh, hello. Yes. So I would do We do that, have a lot in common. I would do that like w- every year for like one week in the summer. It's kind of a paid vacation. I would, it would yeah. be a cut and pay, but you got to eat the food and oh, the yeah. mega was, was so awesome. great. And you yeah. could sometimes jump in on some workshops and stuff that were going on. And I remember what happened was, is it was one of the times where sometimes the classes would be really big. Like you could even have like 60 people in your class, you know, 75 yeah. people even. And one morning, Glenn Black came to my class and someone told me that that was Glenn Black and he was like a big deal around there. Omega, like a a young art teacher, if I'm not mistaken, if I recall. No, it's much more complicated than that. Oh, well, no, I don't really, but I, I, something I just knew him to be yes. like a very. But, de- like, but he did study with Iyengar, and, yeah, okay. and there's there's way more to this story. Yes. But what happened was, which what, which I had already gotten to a place where I was very much about like practice adapting to individual needs. So yeah, he didn't really do my class. He spent almost the entire time in like a supta virasana position. Yeah. Like, I mean, extended, like I had done soup to grass. It wasn't like all supported with like a bolster or anything, you know what I mean? It was like full on, on the floor, soup to virasana for like 20, 30 minutes or something, yeah. you know? And I was like, wow. I mean, I was cool with it. I wasn't, I didn't feel like yeah. Yeah. it. But I was like, hey man, he's got his practice. Do your thing. Yeah. But yeah. I just remember thinking, wow. So that's my one memory, my one like touch up with Glenn Black. But he was and, quite and- a figure around there. And then did he leave or did he, did he, he stay? Was there. He did a few more things. He did leave before the class was over. I felt like he was maybe just kind of checking me out because someone had said something about me and I just appreciated that. Whatever. I didn't like, I didn't really get to interact with him or anything, but I just remember him in that long soup de virasana. Well, and I, I remember just wanna, people saying yeah. he was just like a really hardcore teacher that he like had a pretty hard edge to him. Like I had a teacher like that too, who Allison West, who I studied with for a while, who softened ah, yes. over the years. Amazing. Come, but Amazing. she's super smart. And I studied with her for a long time. But she, too, back then, she was super hard-edged. And I, I heard Glenn was like that also. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So I was trying to tell you about the origin story of Yoga Tune-Up. And now we're talking about Glenn. I want to tell you that you know, that's a huge compliment that he came and meditated and like soaked up the vibe of your class. Like that, see, that's classic Glenn. Um, he, the fact that, you know, he was probably in Samadhi and you facilitated that for him. So that's what I would say. Okay. <laughs> is, that's cool. Is, I don't know. Is, Again, I like, just thought, he I... would have left right away if he would have bounced right out of there. If he didn't think there was some quality happening in that room, I'm telling you right now, because he is a, (laughs) yeah, he's a, he is a beyond a connoisseur. And, um, uh, yeah, I just, I have so much love for my teacher and, um, you know, we talk about it, you know, we talk about our surgeries now. Um, well, you mentioned that in your talk with Andrew, I got to <laughs> yeah. say that was like a pretty intense moment to have with him when, yeah. you know, he, he seemed like he wanted to express some, uh, he, like he taking some responsibility and yeah. I, I really appreciate that he would make himself vulnerable to you like that as well. And I yes. appreciate that you then also wanted to take your share of the responsibility too. Cause I, I certainly don't blame my teachers who I worked with at that time. I mean, I don't, I don't blame them like on like a personal level or something no. like it's their fault or anything, you know? No, just like I wouldn't blame a choreographer for um, giving me choreography that was bonkers. You know, when I was a dancer and when I was a choreographer, you do bonkers stuff. You do it for the art, you do it for the expression. And I think that, that, that yoga toes this kind of weird line between you know science and art, but I really see it as more of an art form because of the experiments, experimentation of it. And um, I think it's great that we can verify some of it with science, and then some of it is I'm just going to say is a goof. I, I really do. I think some of the the positioning, the articulations is really better left for Cirque du Soleil and for the dancers. Right. Um, and, well, and, I want to say, I think that there's, I agree with that. I think that there is some things that science can really explain about what's happening in yoga practice. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff that people are doing that I just, I agree. I don't think is very sound from like a functional level for people's body. Like I love what um, Peter Blackaby said when he came on this podcast, he said, 
You know, if you wanted to teach yoga to a horse, you wouldn't teach it side splits. You know what I mean? There's no no reason. So I feel like that's absolutely true what you're saying. But I also feel compelled to say that there is a part of yoga that isn't science and isn't bullshit but is a little bit unexplainable. Like, I think that there's a little bit of a magic element to it. And I know we worry about that. I don't want us to like, I just wrote a thing about this. I don't want us to like fall into magical thinking or like subject to negative influence from people. But in my own personal experience, there is an element of intuition and mm-hmm. an element of mystery. And I, I think that's okay. And we can have room for that. And well, and that, that's, that's the same place in scientific inquiry. I mean, do you think that, that Einstein was not pondering the mystery? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's cool. Like, we've got to keep, there's the, the edge is the mystery. And let's keep exploring that mystery. Let's keep doing it. And unfortunately, the liability for, that we're talking about right now, you and I, is that our bodies were the liability, mm-hmm. which totally sucks because we are part of that mysterious experiment of the 80s and 90s that now has a consequence in the 2010s of a number of teachers having surgery. Yes, like well, that shit we were doing in our 20s didn't pan out so much in our 40s, did it? Nope. <laughs> well, but you see, um, getting so, back to the, the, the coming up with yoga tuna, because Sure. It, it, it explains it. So you sought out some kind of alternative to the Kool-Aid and that yeah. meant kind of making some distinction, which is a little bit what yoga therapy was. I had Matthew Taylor on recently yes. and we yeah. talked about that, about how he oh was God, the first him. one who admitted it to me that one of the reasons there's yoga therapy is because if you want to go get like a research grant, you can't say yoga because everybody thinks fitness. Uh huh. So that yeah. there needed to be a way to distinguish it, and it seems like you wanted to distinguish your work a little bit from the the more woo woo esque yoga. Yeah. Well, the the fact that so many people in my classes were miserable when I put them in poses, I was like, well, this doesn't. You don't have to be miserable in poses or miss the pose. Let's disassemble the pose, joint by joint. Let's get to know how your joints articulate so that you can perceive them. And then let's reassemble so that the, that the pose is tailored to fit you more efficiently, more congruently, more appropriately. And that you're, you know, you're in the driver's seat of this experience. And it's not that I'm just like snip, cut, 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 cut. Um, now there's triangle pose on you. Snip, cut, 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 cut. There's shoulder stand on you, which by the way, I don't teach snip, cut, 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 you know? So the, the problem that I see in these large classes of 60 and you know, 50, 30, 25 even, is that you, it's very difficult to take the time that's necessary to decompose a pose so that it's appropriate. And, um, and then there's, there's people like me who just the, the range of motion is so off the chart. Like I could do every pose, but it wasn't appropriate. Now I know, mm-hmm. right? It wasn't well, appropriate. What I always say is they told us to do certain things with their body, but they never told us when to stop. <laughs> well, also, also they, the timer, they would put the timer on yeah. and you're like, okay, hold it for five minutes. Yeah. Look, static stretching beyond two minutes renders you with a lack of, of reactivity neurologically. That means your contractile tissues get very dumb Mm. and they get less able to shorten. And that's a problem if you're trying to have integrity in your joints. So when when I departed forest yoga, I departed because I knew I needed to teach in slow motion. I needed to be able to break down the poses or throw them out the window altogether, which is what I did. I mean, I could, it was like, I was like at the diner and the the diner was just cluttered with ketchup bottles and hot sauce and salt and pepper and plates of uneaten potatoes. I just took my hand and the candles and I just like, and I knocked it all off and I was like, all right, blank slate. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, and so I developed this, this, this format yoga tune up and my boyfriend at the time was like, that's really a, not a very spiritual name. I actually had two boyfriends in a row. Who was like, that's not a very spiritual name. You're teaching yoga. That's not yoga. Mm-hmm. And I was so like, you know, oh God, it was so offensive to me because the experience I'd had in yoga prior to that, um, which is so full of dogma and so full of like, you're not doing yoga if you're doing this. You're not doing yoga if you're doing that. And I was just, I was over it. So I was like, you know what? 
I don't want to use, can I, I can exploit it. I was just like, fuck it. Yeah. Like, yo, this is, this is what I'm doing. And, and I was a disruptor. I scared people. It really scared people mm-hmm. that I was doing this thing the way I was doing it. But there were people who had been harmed that started to show up in my classes. And I was like this halfway house between physical therapy and a yoga class. And we started getting more intelligent because they were willing to basically workshop with me every single class. And so my class became this laboratory. And I was renting a martial arts studio. Like sometimes I was paying them to be there. So I was renting a martial arts studio, probably, I don't know, three to five days, five days a week. But it wasn't like... <laughs> It wasn't like it was making money mm-hmm. because sometimes there would be, you know, two people in the class and I'd, I'd already paid 50 bucks for the rental and it was whatever, $16 class or whatever it was, mm-hmm. but it was, we all I, know those numbers. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I was, I had a mission and I love like creativity to me. I I'm a creator. So when I'm in my art, there's nothing that makes me happier. And, but now I was, I was on this mission to be, ultra informed by science and mechanics and um, feedback and, you know, collaboration. And, um, and eventually I got, I started pitching myself to studios as these workshops and my mother worked for JetBlue so I could fly for free wherever JetBlue were. Ooh, uh, that's people. nice. So nobody had to take a risk on me. Yeah, and low I, overhead for travel. Nice. Right. And I came to New York and I taught at Om Yoga mm-hmm. and I taught at Laughing Lotus and I taught mm-hmm. at a lot of big name places. Miraculously, Yoga Journal put me in their magazine um, featuring Nali Kriya and this is before I was even on Facebook. I didn't meet Facebook for a while. Like this was before all. This is when you wrote letters. Yep. And um, <laughs> <laughs> do you remember letter writing? And I you do. have a printer. You know, like yeah. So I I built yoga, and then somebody said, "Oh, well, you should you should trademark." yoga tune up and then i was like oh that's i can't do that i can't do that that's wrong my teach what my teacher think you can't trademark yoga and by the way i had talked to glenn black about this all along because i i wanted i wanted to to like brand glenn's yoga you know and i and i said glenn i've got this great idea for a teacher training and um you know uh for you and we can make videos and I don't know how I got this idea, but he looked at me like I was crazy. I mean, he did. He looked at me like I was crazy. Like, why would I want to do that? Because everybody's <laughs> going to do that, and that's going to be how people make their living ten years from and, now. <laughs> yeah, but he's not a business guy, yeah. and I didn't know. I didn't know that I was a business gal. Like I didn't even know that I had an entrepreneurial bone in my body mm. um, until I met my. And so basically, he just said, "I don't want to do that. Why would I want to do that?" He's like, "I give it all to you," and I was like, "What?" <laughs> Mm. And, um, which was his blessing. And, and now I just want to be clear. Glenn's work is Glenn's work. I just happen to be a very apt and dedicated student of his work, but I'm also a student of many other threads of movement, um, body work, um, and anatomical trainings and so on. And so people are like, Oh, yoga tune is all Glenn Block's work. It, it, it isn't. And it is there's no there's no denying my teacher's imprint, but I'm an amalgamator and I'm a creator. And I learned that through choreography, which is what I learned before I met Glenn. Um, and there's a difference between uh, those teachings, which he sort of granted you his blessing to go ahead and utilize however he wanted to, and making a thing like Yoga Tuna. Like, as you said, those are... Those are just two different things. And we talk about that on the podcast a lot. Like, uh, so that's a, that's an art, as you say, in and of itself, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, so then how yoga tune up came about, um, as a sort of formal thing, I was in the process of getting it trademarked when I met my now husband and I met him online. Hello, match.com back in the day. He's the one who forced me to get on Facebook. I think a year after we started dating, by the way. So, uh, which is now like, oh my God, Facebook, something I actually really enjoy and loathe. I'm sure you have the same experience. Um, I think a lot of people are getting off it. I, I'm certainly on it so much less. It just, it gets more and more uh, un- unenjoyable <laughs> as time goes on sometimes, you know? Um, well, you- it's a very, it's, it's, there's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I still love Facebook. I'm, I'm, I'm not jumping off that
If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.